online today, and I hope you're doing well. So our talk today is Falls and Parkinson's disease, understanding your risk factors. One of the most commonly used phrases we say when we are offering support and reassurance to those individuals who reach out to us is, you are not alone. Most of the time, we are referring to the fact that you are not alone within the context of the Parkinson's population, as there are so many common threads that are similar to many people living with Parkinson's. For example, such challenges as constipation, changes in taste and smell, depression and anxiety, sleep issues, just to name a few. Today's topic of falls, however, really fits under the title of You Are Not Alone, as there, are a great, there is a great deal of research to support the fact that falls are the most common, serious, and devastating problems faced by the older population. More than one-third of Canada's seniors, that is people aged 65 and older, fall each year and 50% of those who fall will suffer moderate to severe injuries, including everything from something as straightforward as a sprain to more serious issues such as hip fractures, as well as even head injuries. These things that permanently reduce their mobility as well as your independence. Don't like those statistics? Sorry, everyone. Please don't shoot the messenger. I'm just stating the facts. Facts that you may not want to hear, but you need to be aware of in order to maintain your independence as long as possible. So given the fact that as we age, the chances of us falling becomes greater, we also need to factor having Parkinson's into the equation. Although loss of balance and falling are rarely a problem, until later on in the course of Parkinson's, some people may have a subtle feeling of not being steady on their feet, even in the early days of this journey. For some people, turning around quickly or trying to stand on one foot to pull on trousers or put on socks or stockings is enough to alert them to the fact that they need to be more careful with things that they used to take for granted. Imbalance may, not, imbalance may be more noticeable when walking on an uneven surface, like cobblestones, for example, or when you're getting jostled in a crowd, or even getting up from a couch. You may find yourself leaning to one side and getting up from an awkward position, such as kneeling while gardening, may alert you to the fact that you have some balance issues. As Parkinson's progresses, balance problems may become more serious, and people may fall without any obvious reason, such as either lightheadedness or double vision. Please note that as with everything else in discussions of Parkinson's, just because you read about it, or because I mention it, does not automatically mean it will happen to you. But I would be remiss and negligent if I didn't provide you with this information. You may not have any of these difficulties, but forewarned is forearmed. Before I go any further about the loss of balance, I ask myself, so what exactly is balance? It may seem obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning because it's not quite as straightforward as it may seem at first, and it's not just standing up on your own two feet. Simply put, balance is our ability to maintain an upright position in any given environment, including uneven surfaces, in low or changing light conditions, or even on moving surfaces. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been out to the airport and been on one of those moving walkways, 
Sometimes I know I find my balance a little uneven as it's out of my depth perception. I'm not moving, but the walkway is, and sometimes that makes me even feel uncomfortable without having Parkinson's. The ability to maintain balance depends on information that your brain receives from three important and different sources. I don't know about you, but I hadn't really thought about balance in quite this way before. The first source is your eyes. Your eyes are sensitive to light and detect movement around you. You rely on information received from your eyes to help you to orient yourself to your surroundings. The second source is your muscles and joints, which are sensitive to stretch as well as to pressure. Nerve impulses come from the neck, ankles, and feet, and are especially important and give information to your brain about the amount of body sway you have in relation to the ground, i.e., are you standing on an uneven, moving, hard, or soft ground? All things that we need to know when it comes to keeping our balance and staying on our feet. The third source relating to balance is your inner ears, which are sensitive to head movements and allow for clear vision when you move your head. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that your balance system includes all the senses of your body. The brain gathers information from all of these areas at the same time and sends messages to your muscles to control your movements and prevent you from falling. So theoretically, if you exercise and maintain strength in your legs, have regular eye exams, and wear proper prescription glasses, and ensure that your inner ears are clear, your balance system will be healthy and you won't fall, right? Well, maybe that's so in an ideal world, but certainly not in the Parkinson's world. In the Parkinson's world, it is loss of balance that becomes one of the most problematic issues and affects many aspects of one's quality of life. At some point in our lives, we have all tripped, either on an uneven surface, on a curb, over an object on the floor that we didn't see, or even a case such as mind over matter, your own feet. Sorry, my throat's a little dry today, so if I stop once in a while to get, to get a, a drink of water, please forgive me. So as I was trying to say, we've all had a problem with tripping at some point, and even in a case such as mine, over my own feet. Most of the time, we are able to catch ourselves or grab something in order to break our fall or hopefully be able to prevent the fall altogether. This ability to react quickly is an automatic and inborn response to an external stimulus that occurs within, uh, with enough speed to prevent falling, co commonly known as a reflex. Postural reflex is the medical term used to describe the numerous reflexes that are necessary to maintain balance when standing as well as when walking. For example, you will all have experienced something called the pull test. That's when your neurologist or your doctor stands behind you and he will let you know that he's going to pull back on your shoulders and the idea is this is a check of your balance. Are you able to, when pulled backwards like that, to stop or break your own fall? Most people will take at least one step back to avoid falling. That's fine. But if, in the process of a pull test, you lose your balance, that is a sign to the doctor 
that your balance is really impaired. I recently overheard a neurologist who was listening to his medical students and his neurology students describe a patient's symptoms. And when the students said, she has a history of falls, just as though they were describing the color of the patient's hair, the neurologist looked at the students and in an exasperated voice said, you do know that adults do not repeatedly fall down without a reason, don't you? The student's response was, oh, I guess we should investigate that further then. And I thought, I, I thought to myself, you think? Sorry, I digress again. Back to the automatic reflexes. So you may be saying to yourself, I'm not falling, so how do I know if I have a balance problem? The reality is that most people acknowledge a balance problem only after they experience a fall. Understanding potential signs of balance problems will keep you from becoming a statistic. So, as you are listening to the following items, make a mental check of the number of signs that you recognize that happen to you on a regular basis. So, this is how do I know if I have a balance problem? Can you identify with any of the following statements? Just in your mind, or if you have a piece of paper, check off the items that may apply to you. I have a tendency to touch walls or furniture when I walk around my house. I avoid walking on uneven surfaces like grass, sand, or on ramps. I feel my body becoming very tense when I am in a standing position or even while I'm walking. I feel unsteady when I need to go to the bathroom during the night. I feel imbalanced when I shower and or when I wash my hair, especially when I close my eyes. I feel uncomfortable about my balance when I'm in crowds, when I'm at the grocery store and walking in the aisles, or when I'm getting onto an escalator. I feel I must walk much slower than my usual speed. I notice I have a tendency to keep my feet far apart when I'm standing or walking. I feel I need to look down all the time in order to keep my balance. I have a lot of trouble negotiating curb steps or stairs. I avoid moving my head when I am standing or walking. I feel a sense of imbalance after moving my head when I am standing. I am worried about doing my usual activities in the same way. For this reason, I find myself now that I tend to avoid going out in case I get into an environment that makes me feel unsafe. I feel an overall decreased sense of self-confidence. If you have checked off four or more of these statements, you should discuss this with your health care providers, as I would say this denotes that you have a balance problem. Falls occur for a variety of reasons, some of which I will discuss now, as the most important thing is to try to differentiate the cause or causes of your falls, since different causes may require very different treatments. I will be very frank with you that falling is a very difficult symptom to treat in Parkinson's patients, since it often responds poorly to medications, especially later in the course of a disease. Having said that, it is difficult to treat falls is not a reason just to give up and accept the inevitable. I'm going to repeat that sentence again because I think it's an important one. Having said that it is 
difficult to treat falls is not a reason to just give up and accept the inevitable. There are some coping strategies that can be implemented to help you deal with balance problems. But first things first, let's look at some of the most common causes of falls. Let's look at difficulties with walking, as that is often your first clue that your balance is compromised. Like all the other signs of Parkinson's disease, walking problems emerge gradually, slowly but surely. At first, walking may be quite normal, and then people begin to notice mild alter alterations. It is very common for the person with Parkinson's to be oblivious to those subtle changes. And it is often care partners who point out that the person with Parkinson's is dragging a leg slightly, or that one arm is not swinging quite naturally when they are walking. These are the things that for those of us without Parkinson's just occur naturally. But a leg that drags or an arm that doesn't swing are actually enough to make an individual feel unsteady, in particular when the person turns or walks on an uneven surface, or a rather deadly one is when you get jostled in a crowd, as I have already mentioned. As I have said before in previous talks, Human beings are finely tuned machines and are put together holistically when the sum of our parts is dependent on each part working normally. In other words, it doesn't take that much to upset our equilibrium or our apple cart, whatever you choose to call it. So continuing on with issues of walking, Another clue that you might be developing balance issues is the speed at which you walk. Are you feeling that you need to be more cautious than you used to? Or have you just started, having just started to walk more slowly? Recently, a person with Parkinson's told me that they used to be the fastest walker in the group, but now they are the slowest and are having increasing difficulties keeping up with others. Does that speak to the actual slowness, or is it just because they're being more careful? Actually, probably both. Also, as problems with walking become more serious, people with Parkinson's will walk with a kind of shuffle. That is when you take a short stride in which you don't raise your feet far enough off the ground. This is where real problems with balance can come up, which frequently do result in falls, particularly when you are trying to turn. If your balance has become significantly impaired, you may fall with very little apparent reason. I know I have talked about the symptom of freezing in my past and previous talks, but I do need to mention this phenomenon again now. As when people freeze in combination with having trouble with their balance, they are definitely more likely to fall. So just to refer and refresh what the term freezing is, this is when people feel that their feet suddenly are glued to the floor, and it is extremely difficult and sometimes actually impossible to lift their feet to take the next step. This form of sudden arrest of motion is called a motor block, or freezing. Freezing seems to affect walking more than other activities, and is especially common one, when a person first starts to walk. Example, when you're getting up from the bed or out of a chair. It is also common when people with Parkinson's, number two, when you have to change the direction 
in which you are walking. Freezing also occurs, this is number three, when you turn around from a standing position, such as at the sink in the kitchen or in the bathroom. And number four, freezing occurs when you try to walk through a narrow space, such as a doorway or on and off an elevator, for example. I just want to take a minute at this point to relate the things I've just talked to you about to your real life experiences when you go for your appointment with your neurologist. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say things like, it's a waste of time going to see my doctor. All he or she does is ask me several questions which I don't see any relevance to and then they ask me to go out and walk up and down the hall. Turn around and come back. Good is that. Actually, these tests tell the doctor a great deal about your symptoms and how you are doing. They are looking for things like, do you swing your arms when you're walking? Or is one arm just kind of hanging down at your side? They're also looking at your stride length. Or, for example, do you shuffle? Or do you drag one foot? Or is the length of your step quite short? Another thing they're looking for is, how do you handle having to turn around and change direction? Are you unsteady? Do you take tiny steps, several of them, in order to come back down the hall? Or do you actually get stuck and have a tendency to fall? So as you can see, asking you to walk up and down a hall is definitely not a waste of their time and certainly not a waste of yours, as it does tell your doctor how you're doing when it comes to your balance. Again, I'm going to reiterate the fact that you have all had the pull test. And again, many of you will have one every time you see your neurologist. This is when the doctor stands behind you, gives you a sudden, brief, backward pull to the shoulders with sufficient force to cause you to momentarily lose your balance and then regain it without needing assistance to stay on your feet and without falling. This is part of something called the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. It's a scale that's done for people with Parkinson's by their doctors all over the world. And it is a test that doctors around the world do as part of their examination for people with Parkinson's. What they are examining are your postural reflexes, your balance, and your ability to stay on your feet which is exactly what would happen to you if you were pushed or jostled in a crowd. And it indicates how susceptible you are to having a fall. Over the course of the disease, you may go from being able to recover immediately. You may take one or two steps back in order to regain your balance to being very unstable. This usually does not occur for many years and usually leaves people unable to stand without assistance, which is why the doctor stands behind you to catch you just in case you can't regain your balance by yourself. So now that you know that there is a method to their madness and what may seem like simplistic tools, these are very important parts of your examination. Maybe you will have more confidence in your doctor's diagnostic abilities now that you understand why they are doing what they are doing. Another major contributor to falls is stooped posture. We usually think of our posture as something that involves just the back and the spine. But for people with Parkinson's, a stooped posture involves your head, your neck and your trunk, all of which lean forward, and the arms are often slightly bent at the elbows. 
Bending forward means that your center of gravity is significantly in front of you and that coupled with the short steps or your shuffling gait, these are large contributors to your risk for falling. Some of you will experience being propelled forward, which is a combination of the fact that your center of gravity is displaced and you have a loss of your postural reflexes. If you don't bump into someone or something to stop the forward progress, you will probably fall. A better way of describing this is that you have a tendency to propel forward as your walking pace accelerates, but degenerates at the same time into rapid short steps. This is known as a festigating, festinating gait. A very common trigger for a fall is when a person with Parkinson's pays attention to something in their environment while they are walking. This may be something as simple as responding to a question or trying to reach out to pick up something. For those who have problems with walking and poor balance, the brain is not capable of handling more than one task efficiently at a time. So it stops paying attention to the walking and concentrates on the second task, with the result that walking deteriorates, and this may very well lead to a fall. So while it is obviously easier said than done, people with Parkinson's need to really focus on the task of walking and avoid being distracted by their surroundings. Another common cause of falls is low blood pressure. This is known as orthostatic hypotension. It is usually experienced when you are sitting up, most commonly from a lying position, such as getting out of bed or even changing from sitting down to standing up. Normally, when we change position like this, our automatic nervous system rapidly readjusts our blood pressure in order to maintain a smooth, and uninterrupted blood flow to our brain. Parkinson's, however, plays havoc with this system, and this reflex actually becomes sluggish. Also, medications used to treat Parkinson's can accelerate this problem. You will be able to recognize that this is a problem for you if after being seated for a long time, you become dizzy or lightheaded for a few moments or even a few minutes as your blood pressure and your blood flow to your brain readjusts when you try to stand up. Another symptom of this problem may be actually fainting or if you have achiness across your shoulders when you're standing. Some coping strategies for this problem are, one, getting up slowly. Get up slowly and stand still before beginning to walk to get your bearings. If your legs are swelling while you're sitting down, sometimes wearing supportive elastic stockings can help reduce the amount of fluid. Increasing the total blood volume in your body which aids in maintaining blood pressure at a higher level, can be helpful as well. This is achieved by drinking at least six, eight ounce glasses of fluid a day, preferably water. I know, blah, blah, blah. Drink, drink, drink. P, P, P. But that's just the way it goes. Sorry about that. This is especially true in hot weather the kind of weather that we've been experiencing recently. Coffee, tea, and some soft drinks may act as diuretics 
and remove some fluids from your body. So if you drink them, please, please, please drink water as well. Dehydration for the average individual in these very hot temperatures can really cause havoc with one's balance. A higher salt intake traps more fluids and helps maintain fluid volume. But be sure to discuss this strategy with your doctor as you may have other conditions that it would be dangerous for you to increase your salt intake. So again, make sure you discuss these things with your doctor. Elevating the head of your bed by placing the legs at the, legs at the head of the end of the bed at least six inches higher than your feet. If you put six, six inch blocks underneath the head of the bed, this can improve your low blood pressure. Hang on one second. Some individuals with Parkinson's may have been taking medications to decrease high blood pressure prior to their diagnosis. We know that for some people with Parkinson's, blood pressure is lowered, and on top of that, some anti-Parkinson medications decrease your blood pressure, so your doctor may need to reevaluate all your medications if you have orthostatic hypotension and allow some somewhat higher blood pressures to avoid excessive drop in your blood pressure when you're changing positions. So for example, if you're already taking uh, water pills um, and other medications that relax the blood vessels, you may want to discuss this with your doctor as these can increase your ability to have this problem with massive drops of blood pressure. Once again, I must caution you, please do not, do not make any changes to your medications without consulting your doctor first. I'm just trying to relate some facts that I know impact on your ability to be able to not fall but at the same time, do not suddenly stop taking, for example, your high blood pressure medication because of what you have heard here today. Make sure that you consult with your doctor before you make any medication changes at any time. As I just mentioned, some Parkinson's medications can cause dizziness and lightheadedness. So at least you get some warning and put coping strategies in place, such as getting up more slowly. However, if there is no apparent reason for your fall, and you are falling with either very little or no provocation, just falling spontaneously, this raises other issues, as these types of falls may happen so quickly and with so little warning that you may have no time to brace your arms for protection and injure yourself. Mild injuries, such as cuts and bruises, are very common, but head injuries and fractures of hips and wrists and arms, etc., are also quite common. And what was once only mild consequences can quite rapidly turn into severe ones. Being more careful sometimes doesn't help, and that isn't enough to prevent serious injuries. But for those of you who fall frequently, you may even have to go to wearing a helmet, an elbow or knee pad. It may not only be useful, but necessary, as the subsequent injuries that occur as a result of fall, including hospitalizations, bring with it a whole new set of problems that I identified in my June presentation. If you are falling for any reason, understanding that balance issues and falls do not respond to medications 
getting involved in a falls prevention program is an excellent idea. Physiotherapists can teach you new movement strategies to use in rising from a chair or a bed, how to roll over in bed, how to turn around and change direction safely while walking. I know you won't want to hear this, but if it is unsafe or perhaps impossible for you to walk unassisted, you may need to start using an assistive device, such as a cane, a walker, and maybe eventually a wheelchair. Be safe rather than sorry. I realize that many of you are reluctant to even contemplate using any kind of a device, as you see those aids as a symbol of the final loss of your mobility and independence. However, these devices allow you to do things that you are afraid to do, such as go out to a mall, go shopping, go to concerts for entertainment and other events, and you are becoming more and more isolated because of your fear of falling. If this is the case with you, you might want to swallow your pride, increase your confidence, and your risk of falling and start living again. Walking poles are a great idea when it comes to falls prevention. There are companies that sell walking poles. They have walking clubs. They will teach you how to use your walking devices. And a lot of people, with or without Parkinson's, use walking poles on a regular basis and they are extremely, extremely beneficial when it comes to keeping your balance. I have spoken to lots of people who are falling, and rather than use any kind of a device, they have restricted all their activities as one way of trying to prevent falls. Though this might sound tempting, this is likely to increase more problems than it is to solve them. Your joints will become more stiff, and your muscles will be weaker, both, of pro both problems which can increase your risk of falling because your body won't be used to moving and maintaining its balance when moving. This is necessary when, which is ha when moving is necessary, which at times it is each and every day. So don't stop moving just because you might have an increased risk of falls. Find a way to make yourself more safe. Of course, it wouldn't be a lunchtime chat with Sandy if I didn't mention the word exercise. The more fit and active you are, the better your body is able to respond to the demands placed on it, meaning that you will be less likely to fall and injure yourself. But of course you all know that, right? There are so many aspects to falls that I can't go into everything today, but I have tried to hit on some of the most common problems and coping strategies. I want to touch on just a few tips to help you reduce your risk of falls around your home. There are many things in the home that could be hazardous and make you more likely to fall, including slippery floors, loose carpets, and general clutter. Here are some tips as to how to reduce the hazards in your home. Try to clear away as much clutter as you can, and arrange your furniture so that moving around is as easy as possible. If the furniture is heavy, make sure you ask someone to help you move it. Don't try to do it by yourself. Hand or grab rails may be useful in tight spaces, such as in toilets, bathrooms, or by the stairs. Putting non-slip mats in the bathroom will also help. 
Always make sure your hose is well lit. Apply strips of colored tape to the edge of the steps in your home to reduce slipping and also to make them more visible. Keep commonly used items close to hand and make sure you have contact numbers nearby in case of an emergency. You might prefer to change your phone to a cordless model so that you carry it with you all the time. Try as much as possible not to rush, even if the phone is ringing or there is someone at the door. If you're prone to fall, you might find a community alarm system really helpful. This involves wearing a small device that has a button to alert an emergency response center, who will send someone to help you if necessary. Floored, floored coverings can sometimes be a hazard. For example, carpet patterns can be visually confusing. Speak to an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist about applying strips of tape or plastic footsteps on the carpet just to make sure that you maintain your focus and your line of sight as to where you should be walking so that your eyes don't deceive you. These can guide you in places you might be more likely to fall, such as a tricky turn on stairs or even in doorways. Last but not least, I want to do a short true and false quiz with you about falls. I'm going to give you a minute to get a piece of paper and a pen. Okay, hopefully you've had a second now. You've got a piece of paper. I want you to put a T or an F beside the statement I'm going to make. And let's see how you do. Ready? Let's go. This is going to test your knowledge about false. So these are all true or false. First, every year, one out of three elderly people falls. True or false? Most falls result in a serious injury. True or false? If you fall but do not injure yourself, this is not considered a fall. True or false? Dizziness is the main cause of falls. True or false? Most falls occur in the bathroom. True or false? After a fall, you should acknowledge that you are not afraid and limit your activity to prevent another fall. I'm going to repeat that because I didn't say that one correctly. After a fall, you should acknowledge that you are afraid and limit your activity to prevent another fall. True or false? Vision changes occur as a normal part of aging. True or false? Vision affects our balance. True or false? Our sense of touch sensitivity does not affect our personal safety. True or false? Falls can trigger fear. True or false? Only the frail elderly are at risk of falling. This should be a no-brainer. True or false? Falls are not preventable. True or false? Okay, let's see how you did. So the first question, which was, every year, one out of three elderly people falls. The answer to that question was true. Every year, one out of three people over the age of 65 falls. The second question is false. 
Most falls do not result in serious injury. Falls are the leading cause, cause of hospitalization and many can lead to serious injury and even death. For most people, however, the worst consequences of falling is emotional. It is embarrassing to admit that we've had a fall. Number three is also fall, false. If you have a fall but do not injure yourself, this is still considered a fall. You should assess your risk, of fa your risk factors that lead to the fall so that you can take positive steps to prevent, to prevent further faults. Number four is faults. Tripping, not dizziness, is the leading cause of falls. Five is true. Most falls do occur in the bathroom. Six is faults. After a fall, you should acknowledge it. Limiting your activity so that you can prevent another fall will definitely lead to further weakness and increase the risk of falling again. Increase your balance ability and your confidence through doing physical activity and consulting a physiotherapist. Number seven was true. Vision changes occur as a normal part of aging. It is important to have your vision checked every year. Eight is true. Vision affects our balance. You rely on information received from your eyes to help orient yourself to your surroundings. Number nine was false. Our sense of touch sensitivity does affect our personal safety. A loss of touch sensitivity in your feet may hinder your ability to detect changes in surfaces and ultimately affect your balance. Number 10 was true. Falls can trigger fear. A fear of falling is often the consequence of a fall. Increasing your knowledge about risk factors can help you to prevent falls. Acknowledging a balance problem before a fall can help to decrease your risk of becoming a fall statistic. Number 11, with faults, the media has led us to believe that only the frail elderly are at risk of falling. But of course, you know that simply isn't true. Multiple factors contribute to fall. And in fact, we are all prone to fall and fall-related injuries. Increased knowledge about your risk factors can help to reduce the risks. And last but not least, number 12 was faults. Most falls are preventable. Falls can be prevented by paying attention to our vision, having regular checkups and wearing corrective lenses as necessary. Make sure you use sufficient lighting and allow ample time to adjust to changes in lighting conditions, especially if you are going from light into a darker place. And keep your glasses clean, please. Risk factors adapt your habits to body changes. Discuss your risk factors with your healthcare provider, especially a physiotherapist. Increase your activity levels to increase your strength, your agility, ultimately your balance, as well as your coordination. Always wear proper footwear. No flip-flops, please. I know it's hot outside but please make sure you are wearing very safe shoes that will stay on your feet without you having to work at it. Again, understand your potential signs of balance problems before you become a false statistic. So how did you do? Bet you know more than you thought you did. Well, that's all for today, folks. There are handouts pertaining to balance, balls and freezing, and an in-home safety check for the answer, for the asking, I should say. Give me a call. Again, it's 416-227-3375, or write to me at sandy.jones at parkinson.ca. 
I'll see you in October, October the 13th. That will be right after my vacation and right after Thanksgiving. I hope you will have a happy one. The topic of October's presentation is research. I have named it From Bench to Bedside, or Why the Heck Does Drug Development Take So Long? Another title for this one is Why Does It Take So Long to Go from Mouse to Man? Anyway, thanks for listening today. Again, you know where we are if you have questions as they come up. Please don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email. Thanks for listening. Take care, everyone, and bye for now.